Welcome to the Roche Idea Lab. Please welcome Angie Howard and Angela Baldwin. Good morning, and welcome to the Roche Idea Lab, or welcome back if you were with us for the first part. Now, the Idea Lab is a community where we can come together to discuss the challenges we face as an industry. My name is Angela Baldwin. And I'm Angie Howard, and we're your hosts of the Roche Idea Lab. I'm the regional business manager for our molecular franchise supporting the Midwest region. I've been with, with in the healthcare industry for 20 years, 12 of which have been here with the Roche family. In my role, I have the opportunity to speak with healthcare executives as well as laboratorians about the challenges that are really facing um, our healthcare industry today. Thanks, Angie. And I'm a board certified anatomic pathologist. I've been working as a pathology liaison in the Medical and Scientific Affairs Division at Roche since April. Um, I work very closely with other members of our Roche team. It's a very collaborative role where I have the opportunity to educate and learn from internal and external partners. Now, we're both really looking forward to hearing the ideas that our guests are bringing to the stage, as well as your thoughts and insights. Now, our healthcare system is increasingly complex. The patient can get lost in the web. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten lost in all of that red tape. You can. At Roche, we believe the patient lives at the center of the healthcare ecosystem. We use technology to connect the systems needed to support patients and unlock possibilities for better care. Now, here to deconstruct how we do that is Noe Aparicio, Umber Jimenez, and Dr. Nam Tron. Uh, it is exciting to be here. Please don't be shy. We want to have uh, an open conversation. If there are questions or, or any clarification, please let us know. Uh, we are excited to be here, especially to have our colleague, Dr. Tran, uh, from the UC Davis Health, uh, leading the, the, the clinical labs there. So thank, thank you very much for being here with us. And Umber and I, we're representing the, the business uh, digital for applications and platform. OK, let's get started. So today, we want to give some examples about uh, digital ecosystems and how is this in real practice. So first of all, um, we know that digital data is bringing new opportunities for laboratories and health systems. The question is, how can this complexity, um, uh, we, how can we overcome that in order to make sure that we are keeping the patient uh, in the center? And that's for that my first question to you, Humber. How do you Thank see that? Thanks, Noe. Um, so actually, we believe that there are three aspects to take into account. First of all is making sure that patient is at the center, right? So we understand what are the diseases and how can we help the patient. Um, the second one is health science and evidence, right? So whatever we bring needs to have a very good clinical foundation to make sure that we're doing the right for the patient and the healthcare system. And the third one is the technology that we have to connect all those systems, because as you mentioned, this is one of the tricky points in healthcare, right? That complexity. So one question for you, Dr. Tran, would be, um, what is your experience and, and how, how you have lived that transformation or how you're living that transformation in the laboratory? Sure, no, that's a wonderful question. So we've experienced on two ends of the spectrum, right? The first spec the front end was, we lived in a world before all this where things were not connected. How challenging is that? Well, you know, I have a device that doesn't talk to another device and doesn't get hooked up to our electronic medical record system in a timely fashion. It doesn't provide the right data at the right time to generate appropriate action. And I'm, I'm a child of the 80s and we evolved into the early 2000s and we recognized the invention of the smart device. And you know, when that first came out, most of us said, why would I want to buy a thousand dollar cell phone? And then that cell phone became a entry point for integration to a larger network of other platforms. Doesn't matter if you were in the iOS world or the Android, phone, Android world. Once that was integrated in one ecosystem, it created value. And I think that's where we now view where laboratory medicine needs to go. What would it be like to live in a world where every one of your instruments connected seamlessly in an ecosystem that allowed it to bring not just disparate data together in one place, but to combine it, fuse it together to make it more meaningful than it is. And I think that's where we need to go and we've pushed in that area by harmonizing the platforms we use, looking at vendors that have better integration, better solutions that can provide that interconnection that we need. All right, so then um, if um, the digital ecosystem is really a key element for that, for that successful digital transformation, um, Umer, can you be, be more specific on how can this look like? Yes, and what I would say is that 
you're totally spot on, and actually you have described very well. But um, what we think at Raj is that um, having the patient in the middle, understanding that the goal is to bring the right information to the right place, as you mentioned, right? This is the goal that we have. So we're dealing with these fragmented systems. So at Roche, uh, we are creating a backbone to connect all the information that we have inside the laboratory and beyond. So basically, we want to provide this infrastructure to allow uh, the different players that can bring new applications and new value propositions to make sure that even if the information is coming from a different place, they can have this information, they can process it, and they can generate the right, um, the right insights for the patients and for the clinicians, right? We have some examples like the glucose meter that we have in Cobus Pulse that we're running third-party applications that can bring value based on the information that they're getting from the patient at, uh, at the bedside, right? So this is, um, this is how Royce is viewing it. Question for you, Dr. Tran, is how do you envision the role of, of the laboratory in the creation of that ecosystem? Yeah, so as many of us know that 70% of, of medical decisions are based on some sort of lab result. So that already emphasizes why we play a central role. But other roles that we've now have seen during, including during the pandemic is laboratorians are the central experts in guiding how good the test is, how should we use the test? We're central to that. So it's our job to not only bring in these technologies, to leverage technologies that integrate information better, but also educate users to bridge those gaps, to be able to create that value proposition, that laboratory test, as well as the data that goes with it, in the right way, right format, right time, right place is the key. And so we have to be advocates here to move that field forward. And I'll, I'll say this, that the future is gonna be predictive analytics. Certain online shopping knows what I want before I know I want it, mm. right? And that's where we need to be. A physician should have a test result about something that they didn't know they want, but predictive analytics knew that this patient will need that test, and that's where we'll be. But right now we have to build that ecosystem because predictive analytics only works well if there is clean data as well as integrated data. It all works together. Excellent, thank you. So then maybe we can share so, um, some concrete examples of uh, ecosystems. So Umber, can you please uh, share with us? Yes, so maybe uh, here we have the Navify Algo Suite. This is one great example, very connected to what you were just saying about the prescriptive, right, or predictive mm -hmm. analytics. So uh, this is an Algo Suite that is containing algorithms that based on the information that we can capture currently from the, from the patient inside the different systems, we can predict different types of diseases, right? Um, we are starting this journey, uh, but basically we are opening this app to third-party companies to come and design their algorithms to make sure that we can expand that because it's very difficult to believe that one company will do it all, right? Uh, so we need to make sure that we deliver the, to the healthcare systems the value that, that they expect, and that will be through collaboration with different partners. This is one, uh, one of a kind. We can have uh, another one which is extending it's extending the lab efficiency outside of the laboratory, for example, in the pre-pre-analytics space, which is from sample collection, sample transportation, and sample reception, right? This is normally an overseen aspect of the laboratory, but can create a lot of mistakes and a lot of problems, right, in, on, on the quality of the sample. Mm -hmm. So basically, we collaborate with third-party companies that can help us uh, measure what's happening outside of the laboratory and bring this information inside of the laboratory, right? So we make more intelligent the decision making inside the laboratory. Another example that we have and we invite everyone to see the, the Cobus Pulse example is um, Cobus Pulse is basically an Android glucose meter. Uh, the primary function is a glucose meter, but because it's an Android device, we can host applications that can execute different value propositions at the bedside of the patient, right? And we have, for example, um, uh, Glucotab or Glytek providing extra information in terms of glucose, that this is very well connected. But for example, we also have a Smart for Diagnostics Connected, which is a third party that helps collect the sample at the bedside. So we can inform the nurse or the phlebotomist at the bedside on what is the process to connect, right? So these are three examples. We have a couple more, but we do not have slides for them. 
um, uh, that this is how we interact with third-party companies, and we want to bring their value into the ecosystem of health uh, through the existing infrastructure and the future infrastructure that we're building, because we, anyway, need to build, right? Is there as maybe any, any experience uh, related with this kind of ecosystems or, or data exchange that you particularly have experience within um, your lab or institution? So our experience is uh, embryonic, to be uh, to completely honest. So we're obviously as early as everyone else in adopting this because we lack these solutions right now, right? So we had to come up with our own solutions and break down barriers that we found. And many of you in the laboratory world probably can sympathize with me is that, you know, our IT folks, they're well-intended, they're, but they're extremely busy, right? So as we bring in these new solutions, we'll have that initial back and forth of why do we need it? add that to the list of all the other things we do. So for, <coughs> excuse me, as, for us at our institution, we decided to come up with uh, ways to better uh, identify the value of these things. We brought up our own R&D lab that's separate from the health system. We're going to be, and it's called the Center for Diagnostic Innovation, and on our side, we're going to bring these solutions up where the bar for IT is a little bit lower. The health security is still there, but it's a lot less busy. And yeah. we bring these in, we show at a small scale, this creates value for a health system then the health system says, oh wow, those numbers make sense. Let's bring it into the bit larger enterprise to do stuff. So you create value um, at a smaller scale to make the way, pave the way for the health system leadership, IT included, to uh, do that. And also at the same time, like I said, we invest with predictive analytics systems that integrate an ecosystem. All those pieces all have to be in place to be successful. Amazing. At this point in time, I don't know, please, is there any question, clarification from the audience? or contribution. No, don't be shy. We can continue. Um, so if this digital transformation is, is so important, maybe how can we, from, from, from um, uh, our company side, or how can we help the community to go faster through this transformation? I think some of the greatest social barriers will be in play. So I will uh, preface with uh, some information that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't understand the difference between predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, compared to say automation. They think it's just another way to automate data. They don't understand that we now live in a time where computers can replicate decision-making skills to some extent as humans do. They're not here to replace us, but they're here to augment what we do. And that lack of understanding is probably an area that we all can focus on, including manufacturers like yourself, where we need to educate people to understand the value of these predictive analytics, understand the value, and understand that value creates those desires to build the bridges, the focus on building ecosystems so that we have clean data. Um, we live in a world right now where our medical records, what we call dirty data, or DIRTA, like that's what we call it. How can we move from DIRTA to actual data and move from data to actual knowledge? That's where the, the predictive analytics comes in. But we need to have all those pieces in place. You can't build a house without a strong foundation, and the foundation is that ecosystem. That, that's where I believe that the standardization plays a key role, right? And when we're creating those ecosystems, it's critical that we have those deals with the different companies to use same standards, same ways. If not, that will not happen, right? Correct. I really like that concept of the clean data. Um, maybe another challenge that we are facing, and I would like your, your personal view on that, um, is the cloud environment. Because mm -hmm. in order to bring these, these new capabilities that were not available before, many times we need to rely on infrastructure that is no longer yep. uh, in the premise of the hospital or the laboratory. What is your personal view on that? I think cloud data is uh, obviously where the future is. Actually, the future is now. So if you asked my institution 10 years ago uh, about cloud data, a lot of people would be afraid. Yep. PHI floating in the cloud sounds like a very risky thing to do. Today, we leverage one of the largest cloud servers out there with a lot of our data. And I agree, cloud data is going to be the key to be nimble, right? Because if we rely on building more servers, uh, I'll use YouTube as an example, as people upload more things each minute, you're going to run out of space. You have to rely on these cloud servers to grow with you. You can't be limited by the, the hardware. And so for us to be nimble to adopt these solutions, we have to rely on these more innovative, more modern technologies, including cloud computing, predictive analytics, and amongst other solutions. Amazing. Amazing. Cool. I'm coming back again if there is any question that you want from us, from Dr. Tran. Is there any other topic that we would like to share? 
that, there's one connected to the cloud piece, which is the cybersecurity mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. So this is this is from our experience. This is one of the key topics that is being you know a minimum. What is your experience in onboarding applications in terms of cybersecurity? What are the elements that you would say that are most important to take into account in that? Sure. So I think I can appreciate from the cybersecurity um, aspect that every time we build an interface somewhere, whether it be virtual or direct, that is also a gateway that uh, more nefarious individuals can try to enter our system. I was told years ago that you know um, at one point every day there's over 700 attempts made on our network from somewhere along the planet. And I'm sure that number is much bigger now. And so I think that's a true concern. Um, I found that different institutions have different standards of cybersecurity. I think that's a risk in and of itself. Some people, some places are too aggressive. May not, and you know, some may say that being as aggressive as possible is the best way to avoid such a risk. But you also prevent innovation. On the flip side, some places may be too relaxed. You may be more at risk for having a hostile takeover of your platform as an institution on the East Coast experience and publish. Uh, so I think that's been the balance. I think there is a clear important um, direction we need to take where the laboratory, vendors, as well as IT work together. Because we live in a world right now where IT feels, and they are truly the uh, stewards <coughs> of the security for the network. Lab is the lab experts, and you guys are the ones that offer the platform. So how do we bring all that together to be able to uh, um, work efficiently together and bring things in a timely fashion. It's great to have a solution today, but I can't implement it for five years. Yeah. And that's been the challenge with many different institutions. I think we all uh, sympathize. Some places may be a little bit faster or slower than others, but on average, we're measuring on a matter of years rather than weeks or months to bring up new solutions. I love, I love this point that you mentioned about, and I want to build on that, which is IT. Yep. I also have been working in the lab space for 17 years. And back in the day, the IT departments, they, they were very different. And this has evolved a lot as well. Mm -hmm. So, is there any piece of advice for that? Should we having them coming to this event? Because this is mm -hmm. mostly for healthcare professionals, but right now you go to a laboratory where there is the expertise. You want to bring a digital system, and unless you make sure IT knows what you're doing, it's going to be a no-go. So, any, any piece of advice? I, I think that's hugely important. I, myself, as a laboratory, I go to clinical meetings just so I can know where the clinicians are coming from and maybe make some friends along the way. And I think that's something that um, is worth trying for. But we also need to really invest in a new cadre of, of IT professionals that are equally good at laboratory and equally uh -huh. good at IT, right? Because oftentimes, I, and I know some of my colleagues, they went into an IT because they had an interest, but they were first and foremost a physician, a pathologist, or a clinical lab scientist, right? And they were trained to learn about that, but they were first and foremost a physician or healthcare worker um, at the bedside. On the flip side, you might have some really pe people who are amazing IT technologists and whatnot, but they just learned about the lab. And we never have found that nice mix of both specialties uh -huh. to really make a difference. I don't expect everyone to be that, but we should have some people that lead the way, that shows up to these meetings that have an even balance of both clinical, laboratory, as well as IT. We haven't seen that yet. There are very few of those. Those are probably those people that are worth, are worth their weight in gold, I would say. Okay. That's very interesting. Any other? Thanks a lot. All right. No more comments from the audience? Okay, so I think we can then close it. So then let me say a big thank you for the audience for having us today. Big thank you to Dr. Tran thank to you. accompany us during this talk. And anyone wants to know more about partnerships or uh, the innovation piece on Navify, please find us in the booth and we will be more than welcome to have you there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.